Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming out to uh, our second keynote for our folks. And uh, just want to uh, uh, thank everyone. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, the uh, person who's going to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Jeff Bilbro, professor of English at Spring Arbor University. Uh, special thanks to Jeff. Jeff uh, had the idea for liturgy. He got our keynote speakers here for us this year. So uh, if you're having a great time uh, tonight and this week, uh, be sure to thank uh, Dr. Bilbro for that. And with that, I will turn it over to him. Thanks, Mark. You know, you know, Alan's very important when the uh, introducer needs to get introduced. Uh, this, this was supposed to happen, you know, a year ago when we could gather in person, but uh, nonetheless, virtual is better than not at all, right? Uh, I am excited that you'll all be able to hear from my friend Alan Noble tonight. Uh, Alan and I attended Baylor University a long time ago. It makes me feel old, um, but uh, became uh, good friends with him, learned to value his wisdom and his nuanced responses to, to really complicated issues. Uh, a couple things that Alan has been involved with that you might be interested in. He uh, co-founded Christ and Pop Culture back in maybe 2007 or something like this, a long time ago. Uh, and it's kind of a big deal now, a very lively community, um, really thoughtful essays on pop culture and thinking uh, for, about what's going on around us from a Christian perspective. So you might check that out. Alan's also been affiliated with the AND campaign, um, which is a great organization. You may remember Justin Gibney, who has been at SAU both in person and then this fall, he was back virtually uh, at SAU. So um, if you're thinking about you know, Christianity and politics, uh, I would recommend the AND campaign as a thoughtful institution. His boring day job is uh, as a professor, assistant professor of English at Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, and, and in addition to lots of essays and uh, shorter pieces, he's also written, I think I can say this, uh, a couple of books now. Um, Tim Keller, who is this random pastor you might've heard of, he once tweeted out an image of Alan's first book, Disruptive, disruptive Witness and wrote, best book I've read recently. No, I did not get paid, nor was I contacted to say it that I mean it. <laughs> so, so that's what Tim Keller thinks. He's actually right. Um, and then Alan has a new book coming out later this year, You Are Not Your Own, Belonging to God in an Inhuman World. And my sense is that his talk on Thursday will, will be related to that project. So if that topic sparks your interest, come back Thursday. But tonight, Alan is inviting us to reflect on a really important question that you may not have uh, thought about often. Why doesn't the gospel cause riots? So take it away, Alan, answer this question for us. What a great lead in. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and, and if, if there are any objections to the keynote speakers, uh, you can also talk to Dr. Bill Bro uh, about that. You can complain to him. I want to talk, uh, I want us to go to Acts 19 and look at this fascinating passage in, uh, 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 in the New Testament that always, as Dr. Bobo said, um, shocks me and sort of uh, confronts me and disturbs me in some interesting ways. So I'm just going to read this. I'll be reading from the NIV. I know that whenever a pastor asks people to go to, you know, they always say, and I'll be reading from, so I want to I'm going to do that. I'll be reading from the NIV. Uh, no, excuse me, the ESV. See, this is why I'm not a pastor. The ESV today. Okay. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, it's a good name, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business, we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that gods made with hands are no gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but that also the temple of the great goddess Artemis might be counted as nothing. And that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worships. When they heard this, they were enraged and they were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, 
Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, his disciples, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asriarchs who were friends of his sent him to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now, some cried out one thing and some another for the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, uh, uh, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hands, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, what a way to spend an afternoon, two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so that's the setting. And when I read this passage, I always wonder to myself, why isn't that the gospel doesn't start riots uh, in modern America? Why don't we see similar riots to this? It troubles me. Think about this. So the Apostle Paul, he's in Ephesus, and he's doing what he did all over the Mediterranean. He's preaching Christ. He's calling people to repentance. He's observing the fact that idols are not actually gods. And in Ephesus, they have this massive temple to Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. It had been rebuilt three times, but all things considered, it had been around about 700 years. If you lived in Ephesus, this was part of your identity. You were proud of this temple and of your goddess. Uh, this was part of your heritage. When you, um, you know, I not to use a, a sports example, but uh, you know, when I moved to Oklahoma City or the outskirts of Oklahoma City and the Oklahoma City Thunder were a great team and we had all these superstars, there, there was a sense in, for, for everyone in Oklahoma, like this is part of who we are. Well, it was sort of like that, except much, much, much more so. This is part of their heritage. It identifies them. But it was also part of their livelihood, which was also true of the Thunder. Uh, tourists came from all over to visit this, the temple during the festival to Artemis. You have an entire economy built around tourism and the selling of idols uh, or statues of Artemis. Now, the crazy thing is, if you were an Ephesian, maybe you didn't even believe that Artemis was a real god. But it didn't matter because she brought the city together and her worship paid your bills. Not to belabor the analogy, but <laughs> it was possible years ago to not actually care about basketball at all. But if you lived in Oklahoma City, part of your livelihood would have come from the success of this sports team. You could, you don't even know how basketball works, but you know that if Kevin Durant is, is a successful player, you're going to get more income because the city will do better. There was even a decent chance, maybe you met your spouse at one of these festivals to Artemis. So this was a part of your personal history and it helped pay your bills. So did Artemis actually bless the city of Ephesus because its people worshiped her? I don't think that many people actually asked that question because frankly, it didn't matter. In the Roman empire, Nobody really cared so much about who you worship so long as you were loyal to your local God and you were a good, productive Roman citizen. Except Paul. Paul's a troublemaker. So Paul walks into Ephesus, and I imagine him strolling through this marketplace, and he sees this couple uh, who's shopping for a nice statue of Artemis, right, that they want to put on their mantle back in Rome, as, as one does when one is... Uh, being a good tourist in Ephesus. They want to impress their friends, uh, a good story that they could tell about their trip to Ephesus. And the idol salesman is standing there talking about all the best features of this statue, the, you know, the, how it was made, uh, how it, it's guaranteed to bless their home, how he's, he's had personal experience that of the positive benefits of owning one of these statues of Artemis. And Paul walks up to this couple and he's like, Psst, Guys, this idol was made by some dudes in the back of this shop. It's not real. It's not going to make your life better. It's not actually a god. I feel a little bit bad for the salesman because, you know, maybe he's thinking, dude, this is my job. You know, like, don't ruin this sale for me. I, I need this commission. But Paul walks away. 
And uh, the salesman watches as Paul goes across the street and he accosts another couple. Hey, uh, telling him the same thing. This isn't, a, this is an idol. This idol is fake. It's not the image of a real God. It's not going to answer your prayers and it's not going to fulfill your life. It's not going to do the things that it promises to do that they say it will do. It's a lie. So the salesman, he goes to Demetrius, the silversmith union boss, and tells him what's happening. And Demetrius gets all the silversmith union members together for an emergency meeting. And his, his, his speech is pretty simple. And it's very telling. He's going to talk about Artemis as a god who deserves respect. But he only talks about that after he talks about the economics. And so what he says is, essentially, look, selling statues of Artemis is making us wealthy. And then we have this dude, Paul, persuading people that our idols are a con. They are not images of a God and they can't improve people's lives. If we let this foreigner keep, uh, keep this up, we're gonna go out of business. Our city's economy will crash. And, you know, plus we don't want Artemis to be disrespected. Uh, this is our city. How are we gonna let some dude come in here and disrespect our goddess like this? And so they riot. They grab Paul, presumably to kill him because he not only questioned their goddess, he challenged their livelihoods. He upset their entire civic life. The basic way they understood themselves, their practices, their forms of life, their liturgies, they were all centered around the temple of Artemis. And when you think of Acts 19 in this way, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that, that maybe there's something wrong with us since we don't have gospel inspired riots going on. Which raises the question, why? Why not ever? What are the possible reasons? What could explain this? Well, the, does, does America, let's say, for example, let's say, uh, does America have fewer idols than the Roman Empire? And I think we have to say good grief, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, um, uh, our industries, our science, our advertising, our technology have given us idols that far are far more impressive than anything you know Demetrius and his his buddies, the silversmiths of Ephesus, could ever have made. So it can't be that. Well, perhaps Americans care less about their idols than the than the Ephesians did. But again, I think no, that's that's not it. That can't be it. If anything, I think we have to admit that we are more convinced that our idols represent real ideals. We believe that our idols uh, really will improve our lives and fulfill us. In that sense, uh, you could say that we're more religious than many citizens of Ephesus. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about idols here, contemporary idols? Well, uh, you know them. Wealth, beauty, sex, consumption. Let's pause here a minute and talk about consumption for a minute, the idol of consumption, which is the belief that if you just buy this one thing, you'll feel complete. Your existence on earth will be justified. The funny thing is it's never enough, which is a characteristic of all idols. It's never enough. When I was a kid, uh, I used to get, I used to see these, I distinctly remember going to the grocery store, I went to Albertsons in California, Southern California, and uh, we'd be waiting in line and, uh, you know, because they're good at selling things, these grocery stores would have this whole rack of, of garbage, you know, trash toys. Um, so that kids like me who were standing in line with their mom could look over and, and nag their mom, beg them, annoy them until they got, bought them something. And <laughs> what, what I always wanted were these uh, little plastic uh, um, soldier parachutes Right, so they, these little plastic soldiers, right, and they have this nice little plastic uh, parachute with some string attached to it. And I remember very distinctly feeling like, man, if I could get that toy, my life, I would be so much happier. My life as this, you know, five-year-old Alan or whatever it was, my life is incomplete because I just don't have this one thing. It looks so much fun. And the worst thing that could happen in those moments would be my mom gave in. Right, would and which didn't happen very often because we didn't have much money. But but if she did, and it, it, occasionally it did, and she said, "Okay, I'll buy it for you, Alan." Um, that was actually the worst because 
by the time I unwrapped it, I was already disappointed. But next Tuesday, when we go shopping again, <laughs> I'm back in line. I see the toy and I still think, mm, yeah, but maybe this one will make me feel complete, make me feel fulfilled. The latest rumors that I've read say that there will be an Apple event in about one week. And uh, according to rumors, this, is, this latest event is where they're going to announce a new iPhone. And some of us here um, will read the details as the event is going on. We'll read it live on Twitter or on some Mac rumors page or whatnot. And we'll look at our pathetic iPhone from last year or the year before and think, you know, if we could just get a way to get this new iPhone on launch day, that's not that we would make our lives would be complete, but we would feel a little richer, a little more satisfied. Our lives would be a little more exciting, fulfilling. And like six-year-old Alan, you open the box and you immediately feel the sense of letdown. One more example. Uh, Mazda recently had an ad campaign and the tagline for the ad campaign was feel alive, feel alive. Such a fascinating phrase. I like to remind my students that um, because this is a, what, I, what I think of as a, as a contemporary anxiety, the anxiety that you're not feeling alive, that you wanna do things to feel alive. Of course, everyone who is alive feels alive. The only people who don't feel alive is people who aren't alive. So if you're alive, you're feeling alive. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a powerful concept and it sells things. So that's the motto. That's the tagline in these commercials, buy a Mazda, feel alive. And I just, I can't help but think, man, if your life feels empty and dead and pointless and you try to fix that by buying a Mazda, you're just gonna feel empty and dead and pointless and disappointed and in debt and you'll be driving a Mazda. All right, back to my idols, my list of idols. Uh, power, success, love, racism, fame, attention. And I think behind them all for us contemporary people is the idol of the self. Okay, so we have no shortage of idols. That, that's not our problem. Then why don't we see modern idol makers rioting to silence the gospel? Why aren't they worried about losing their jobs? Maybe the reason is that our practice of living in the world has much more in common with the average Roman citizen than it does with the posture of Paul. Remember, that fundamental reality for the Roman citizen was not necessarily that Artemis was a real living God. Maybe they thought that. Maybe they didn't. The basic identity, the thing that defined them most was their Roman lifestyle, their, their Romanness. And Artemis just happened to be the goddess of the city that some of them were living in, and so they worshipped her. Now, that wasn't true for Paul. His identity came in standing before God. Christ wasn't an add-on or a style or a local deity that Paul could easily adopt as his own to fit into the local Ephesian economy. Christ was at bottom of every way he saw himself. So the gospel comes into Ephesus and ruins the city's economy because that economy was built on idolatry. I'd suggest to you that most of us, most evangelicals in America today are again, more like Roman citizens. While we are passionate about our God and will defend him and argue about him, or we'll wear Christian t-shirts or share Christian memes, our faith is really something we add on top of our, more, of our more basic identity. And that identity is perfectly comfortable with supporting the production of idols. Let me explain what I mean by this basic identity that we all share today. I want to introduce you to a, to, I want to introduce you to a term called expressive individualism, which might sound academic, but it's really just a technical term for a set of ideas a set of ideas that you have heard expressed probably your entire life. I know I have. And it goes something like this. You are a unique individual. Your mission in life is to discover who you are by looking inside and then living authentically to the person you discover there. You must be true to yourself and your values. 
You must pursue your passions and your dreams because living for anyone else is a kind of death. Life is your story and you want to tell a good one. You want to have fun and be successful. You also aren't afraid of decisions that hurt you because you, you know from watching, let's say television dramas, that even tra tragedy and suffering can make a good story. To live authentically, you have to express your identity, who you are. You have to announce it to the world. And you have to do so without fear of what others may think. In fact, you feel most alive, there goes that idea again, feel alive. You feel most alive when you find ways to express yourself, who you are, and the things you care about, and other people acknowledge and accept you. Most of this expression comes, by the way, through consumption. You purchase clothes to express your style. You purchase a car to express your sense of freedom or your lack of concern for the environments or your concern for the environment, depending on the kind of car you buy, I suppose. You purchase certain music to express your vibe. Here's something most people don't wanna talk about, but I think it's crucial for under, understanding expressive individualism. It's, uh, it's not a coincidence that expressive individualism is profitable it for consumer capitalism. Think about this. If you feel justified and alive by expressing your identity through purchases, you will never stop needing to buy more stuff. As long as you're alive, you will need to be somebody. And in order to be somebody, you'll have to shop. And that's exactly where we are as a society, addicted to buying more and more. Because the nature of idols is that they, uh, that they never fulfill their promises and they always demand more of us. You can also spend a lot, large amounts of your day, in addition to consuming, you can spend large amounts of your day building your personal brand on social media, which is really just another way of expressing yourself. Instagram stories, tweets, Facebook posts, YouTube videos. The sad thing is that you know you should never feel a sense of joy when someone likes your latest selfie, but you do. Because it feels like they're validating our identity. I don't think anybody except the very, very naive, the very, very naive genuinely thinks I should feel good that this person liked myself. I, I, I should feel that my, my personality, my personhood is, is validated by this, by this like. Everybody knows that it's empty and hopeless to feel validated by likes or comments or retweets or whatever, or shares on social media. But that little rush of contentment, that sense of peace, a momentary glimpse of self-confidence, it feels good. And we do it anyway, because I think many of us can't imagine an alternative. And that's how you get this strange circumstance, this strange phenomenon where, where beautiful people with massive followings on Instagram will unironically post carefully edited, perfectly staged photos of themselves with captions that say something like, be yourself, even when no one recognizes your inner goddess beauty. And we're like, Tap, tap, that's true. Because we love the idea of not depending on the validation of other people, but we also love the idea of being beautiful and Instagram or famous because people will validate us. In fact, I, uh, most people that we idolize collectively as a society are those who have made careers out of, think about this, expressing their individuality, so musical artists, reality TV celebrities, professionals, uh, YouTubers. Some of us chase after that life itself or our own version of it in hopes that if we just receive enough public affirmation, our lives will matter. And we will discover gurus, self-care experts, life coaches, exercise programs, and self-improvement strategies that promise to help us be successful, that promise to help us express ourselves and be fulfilled humans. On the other hand, um, other of us feel hopeless, I think. 
like we can never really compete in a world where everyone is trying desperately to be somebody. The competition's too fierce. So instead, we maybe latch on to a celebrity and live vicariously through them. I've seen this happen. Oh, obsessively following their YouTube channel, or, or maybe we decide that our life is a tragedy. That's the narrative for our life. Our life is a tragedy. And so we surround ourselves with music and movies and voices that tell us how deeply unfair it is that our lives will never matter. And we find a community of hopeless people to commiserate with. Let me pause here and make something very, very clear. Um, this is not a lecture about how young people today are the worst. What with their tweets and their TikToks and so on. That may be true, but that's not my point. Remember what I said, expressive individualism is the basic identity for most Americans today. So it's not just you, it's not even primarily you, it's everyone. So far I've been using examples that I, that I hope might seem at least somewhat familiar, but older people in this society really don't have it any better. Look, if I feel like the only way my life is meaningful is if I am a successful businessman who people admire or a successful professor who people admire, that's not any different in kind to looking for validation through social media affirmation. And there are older people, million of, millions of them in fact, who are convinced that if they buy the right product, they will, quote, feel alive. Mazda knows this, you know this. So this isn't about the youth today. Let's imagine some possibilities. Take your auntie on Facebook, for instance. I don't wanna talk bad about anybody's auntie, so we'll just, Let's just say maybe, just maybe, when she posts that stock photo of a sunset, which a very low quality image of a sunset, right? And there's a Bible verse on top of the, of, of the sunset, and it says something about rising on the wings of e eagles. Let's consider that maybe she's not actually trying to persuade anyone of the truth of the gospel. She's not even seriously trying to encourage other believers with scripture. Although she'd probably never admit it, what motivates her is a desire to express her faith publicly. She identifies as a Christian. And so when she saw a Christian image that she thought was cute, she wanted to share it with all her Facebook friends so they know who she is, so she can express her identity. Maybe. Or maybe you consider your uncle or my uncle. <laughs> maybe this is just speaking from personal experience. I'm not saying anything about my my relatives, but hypothetically, I'm, one might have an uncle like this who posts crazy political rants on Facebook, insane political rants on Facebook. And he has zero intention of persuading anyone ever <laughs> of his political views. He doesn't even try to understand why people think differently than him. That's, I, I don't think it's crossed his mind, but he does love to express his opinion. And if you think about it, the thing that he loves most is other people knowing who he is. That's expressive individualism. Because one quality of expressive individualism is that we aren't concerned with persuading our neighbors to believe and do what is right. Our overriding concern is to express our identity, which is one small reason why our country, I think, is so divided right now. Nobody wants to persuade anybody else. They might want to coerce people, but they don't really want to persuade people. We just want to be seen arguing. Because when we are seen arguing publicly, then our identity is expressed. And we feel just a little bit alive, even if we don't own a Mazda. We saw with the example of your auntie, my auntie, somebody's auntie on Facebook, how, how faith in Christ can become just another preference, another lifestyle option among, along with things like music and clothing style and your political views, etc. So can you see now why we don't have riots over the gospel? If the most fundamental thing non-Christians and Christians in America believe is that our lives matter when we discover our identity inside of us and express it primarily through consumerism, then the gospel's not really a threat. It can be effortlessly appropriated into the market. If our faith is really just another thing we express as part of our identity, then our neighbor doesn't need to be threatened by it. 
if I try to evangelize my neighbor, he can just walk away thinking, you know what, Christianity is, you know, it's really working out well for Alan. Good for him. Personally, I've got CrossFit or Fortnite or, you know, whatever. Cryptocurrency. <laughs> Politics. Meanwhile, I walk away from this conversation and I post on Twitter about how I witnessed to my neighbor and, and neither of us risked anything. We both entered the conversation assuming that the other person was just going to express their preferences. I told him how Christianity was great for my life and he told me how I, he really finds CrossFit to be fulfilling. We might as well have been debating diets. Now, if this is all true, if most evangelicals accept expressive individualism as a basic way of understanding life, like everyone else in America, or at least the vast majority of people, then our gospel proclamations never cause riots because we never fundamentally challenge what matters most to our neighbors. American corporations and unions and industries are not afraid of our faith because we aren't asking them to give anything up. In fact, many of us are members of the Silversmith Guild, <laughs> building idols all week long and faithfully attending the festival to Artemis, hoping to meet our spouse. We can't afford to call out idols of our culture because we're just as wrapped up in crafting idols of self. We're just as committed to the idea that we shape our own story. And that should be terrifying to us, by the way. Um, because when you get involved in making idols, you lose your human freedom. Psalm 115 says this, verse 4, Their idols are silver and gold, their work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them so do all who trust in them. I love that verse. Those who make them become like them. Building idols sounds like it could be a, an ego inflating job, I mean, if you think about it. So, so I, I'm the one who's making this, this object of worship. Um, uh, th that makes me kind of godlike in a sense. And I do think that many, let's say, lifestyle gurus or creators do have a kind of God complex. They do uh, as I imagine Demetrius of Ephesus must have felt. But when you make idols, the psalmist says, they remake you. The liturgy of idol making, the practice, makes you less human. You can no longer speak or see or hear or smell or feel. Why? Well, because an idol demands everything of you. The idol speaks, not you. You become like them because you can no longer use your creatureliness for the ends which God has made you to worship him and enjoy him forever. To really see is to see the beauty of creation and the needs of your neighbor. To really feel is to put your hands and feet to the work of serving God and loving your neighbor. To really speak is to testify the goodness of God and the goodness of his creation. But in a life of idol making, our creatureliness becomes conscripted into the service of idol worship. So you only see things for you to possess or to dominate. You only feel the pressure to be more productive or more alive. And you speak only to let your identity be known in an indifferent world. None of which we were made to do. So then what can we do? How could we become like Paul instead of citizens of the Roman Empire? Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll admit, I, I don't think this is easy. Because every other force in contemporary society is urging us to practice expressive individualism. We see it in a million different inspirational posters in grade school. Commercials uh, beg us all day long to give in to our desires and to stand out in the crowd by owning more stuff. Social media cultivates in us habits of narcissism so that it becomes really hard for us not to obsess about our online image. These societal forces are strong, they're very strong. To resist them, to practice a faith that challenges the livelihood of idol makers, a faith that could end up starting a riot, you need to learn that you are not your own. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. If that idea 
that you are not your own makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. I think it should. Because the idea that we are not our own, that we belong to Christ, and through Christ we belong to the church, and we have obligations to live for the good of our neighbors because of Christ, to whom we belong, all these ideas are deeply foreign to the American way of life. Expressive individualism starts with the assumption that we are our own, that we belong to ourselves, that we are responsible for making a life of purpose and meaning for ourselves. But Christ calls us to die to ourselves. And Paul tells us that we are not our own. And if they're right, then what motivates us? What gives our lives significance and meaning? What makes us feel alive? trademark Mazda, isn't how we express ourselves or whether people affirm our expression. What matters is the truth of existence, that God made you, that he loved you enough to send his son to die for your sins, and that by submitting to him, you can have life and life abundantly. And that life has nothing to do with being someone or crafting a personal brand. It's a life of service. It's a life of charity, of love. It's a life of warning others that idols never represent real gods. They never fulfill what they promise. And so I think that it is a life that may just start a few riots. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Noble, for, uh, for that uh, good word. Uh, I was reminded of that, that great theologian, Tyler Durden, uh, who, who warned us, uh, the things you own end up owning you. And yeah. uh, that we continue to, uh, we, we continue to uh, replicate that. Uh, thinking that this is the American way of life is just a, a normal thing and not realizing just how uh, unusual. And as you're suggesting, I think today, how obscene uh, in many ways it is. And um, it's good for us. Uh, a call to liturgy is a call to uh, step uh, step outside, if we can, of this consumer society and uh, critically look at it and see how much we want to participate in it. So thank yeah. you. That was a great word. Um, we want to open it up for questions now. So uh, please, uh, as, as questions arise to you, unmute. It would be great if you could uh, show your face, maybe two. Uh, that would be wonderful as well. You have an Anne campaign chapter starting up on campus. That's cool. Thank you, Anna Fuller. That's good to hear. Love to hear that. If uh, you know, one possibility is you type in a question, I can I can read it too. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable speaking, you know that could be easier. I have a question for you. Yes. I'm hoping that if you answered this, I didn't miss it, but I would like to know in your daily life, how are you calling out idols that you see around you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, I'm, it, it's a little easy for me, I think, um, because I get to teach literature and a lot of literature um deals with, addresses, discusses uh, many of our contemporary idols. So I'll give you an example. First, so uh, last week I taught Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. And, and in that novel, uh, very explicitly, the character is burdened with this uh, uh, need, this responsibility to make her life matter. And the anxiety that she's about to graduate college and she has no clear plan and she might live a pointless life. And she's terrified by this. And so for me, it's not actually that difficult because I get, to, I get to walk students through this and say, look, Sylvia Plath was right. This is an acute feeling at, that many of you will share. And its premise, it's based on, a, a, on an idol, on, on a false teaching, which is why Plath's character is miserable. Um, and so we talk through the fact that that idol does not fulfill its promise. That 
Esther Greenwood, the, the protagonist in this novel, cannot give this, get the sense of fulfillment that she wants by actuating her or expressing her identity. That, that, that throughout the novel, she's constantly striving for more and feeling inadequate. So it's a little easy for me. However, I will say that we are surrounded by these stories in advertising, in film, in television, that are opportunities for us to push back and to say, you know, the unspoken assumption behind this is that through this, we will have a more a fulfilling life. And we might say to our neighbor, look at how nonsensical this is. Look at how ridiculous this is. Let's observe this. Um, now, like uh, Paul, we might have some people get angry or annoyed with us, like, oh, why are you calling attention to the fact that if I buy a car, I'm really not gonna feel fulfilled. Why, could you just leave me, just let me have some fun for once? Like you might be a little annoying. Um, but pulling back the veil is I think an essential, an essential job. It's essential for our, our own hearts because uh, these messages are, we're inundated with it. So we need to remind ourselves, okay, the, the, the logic of this commercial, the logic of this story, the logic of this teaching is based on a false premise about what life is about, about the basic things of existence. And I can see that. I can see it's based on a certain kind of individualism that is ultimately corrupt. Now that helps our own hearts, but, it, but when we share those thoughts, I think it can help our neighbors. Um, so so I, think, uh, I think that's uh, a, a practically a way that we can do it. I think there's, there's even more specific things that we can do that I think we have to be very careful about, but there, um, it seems to me that there are some uh, markets, some fields, some occupations that, um, or at least working at some businesses that, that, that maybe as Christians, we should step back and say, can I righteously, can I faithfully work at this place or, or will I be complicit? Will I really just be helping people uh, live these false lives? Um, that's not an easy question to answer. My fear is that we're so afraid of offending people that we, we don't ever bring that up, except in extreme examples, right? So like, don't work for the mob, right? Like, oh, okay, cool. But uh, what if there are like socially acceptable jobs, careers that are actually toxic to your neighbor, uh, that invite your neighbor to think of themselves as primarily fundamentally an individual who has to work to establish and justify their lives. And maybe working at that job is actually just making it worse for your neighbor. Um, and so I, I, I think it would be fruitful for people to at least begin asking those questions to reflect on those questions. They're not, it's not easy answers and, and sometimes it's not cut and dry, but uh, I think we err on the wrong side now. That's a good question though. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Um, I have a question as well. And the question is just simply this, right? So within sort of Western society or Christendom um, as, it, as it was, there's Christianity has been so incorporated, so expected, the, the stories and the tales and the meaning making that it's, that's been, have been so um, partially integrated into social norms and so forth. I guess my, my question is, um, obviously setting it up against Paul in Greek Ephesus is one thing, but what are ways and times in which you've seen the gospel being uh, I guess, I don't know, truly insulting or truly offensive to cultural norms. I mean, do you get, have good anecdotes or expressions of this? I'm not very good at anecdotes, but you're raising an important point. And, and you know, this troubled Lewis too, that uh, you know, one of the inspirations for Chronicles of Narnia is this, the fact that, you know, if you were raised in, in, in England at the time, you would have heard the gospel. And so it would, it would feel familiar, so familiar that it was hard to even see and I think that's certainly the case uh, for us in America. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy. And this is one of the things I tried to, to, to stress. 
the idea that you could that you can be in the church and really be committed most of all to expressive individualism. Most be committed to this idea that you've got to have a certain identity. So for some people, and this, this terrifies me, but I, but I do think that for, for some of my students, that the way they conceptualize their faith is primarily as a, as a lifestyle option. So being a Southern Baptist is not about ascribing to a certain set of doctrines, let's say, but it's about a certain performance that, that they feel comfortable with in their particular community. And then you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the troublesome thing is that when that is the case, uh, the, the gospel becomes co-opted, becomes perfectly, uh, you know, it can fit nicely in. Um, so not to be that guy, but I wrote a book called Disruptive Witness that is uh, kind of based around this exact question, right? This idea that, that, that we actually have to have a witness that is upsetting because the way that our neighbors are going to hear the gospel is as a lifestyle option, not as the radical thing that it is. And I don't think there are easy ways to do this. I don't think that there are easy ways to do this. I think that it can, it can take place in, uh, it can look many different ways. Uh, for me, my experience has been that the most effective way to do this is building personal relationships with people and getting people to slowly work through how they understand the concept of God and how they understand the, the concept of Christianity. In other words, in an age when religious language is so familiar that it's meaningless, uh, going to strangers and talking about faith can be meaningless. It doesn't have to be, but it can be empty. And sometimes what we have to do is do the hard work of unpacking words. So for example, I think for contemporary people, it's very difficult to conceive of an existing loving um, uh, uh, God, an actual God, not, not an idea, not a, not a, a place you go to church uh, because you want your kids to learn good morals, right? But like, actually a God that you owe yourself to, I think that's, I think that's very difficult for contemporary people to think through. And for me, I mean, the only way practically to do that is the slow work of, of loving people, of being in community with people and talking them through this, of pulling apart terms uh, over the course of sometimes years. Um, so that's been one experience. Another experience I've had, and I mentioned this in, in, the, in the last question, I think stories are very effective at this. Uh, not all stories, but I think that some good stories naturally confront us with things like death, um, naturally confront us with things like beauty. And when that happens, uh, we have opportunities to unsettle people's expectations and conceptions of their life and their faith and identity and so on and so forth. The example I like to give is Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Uh, it's a powerful novel which forces readers to imagine a world where all social structures are gone. And then it poses the question, if you didn't have the police, if you didn't have your neighbor, if you didn't have the church, if you didn't have hope for a tomorrow, why stay alive? Why not kill your neighbor? Why be moral? Why exist at all? Um, we live in a culture that allows us to not think about those questions. We're very good at ignoring those questions. And here's a novel that if you can read it with people, sometimes they, it will upset them, but in a good way, because it makes them think, what would I do? Would I kill my son in this situation? How, how, how would I live? Why would I live? What, what reasons, what principles are there for me to continue existing? So I think uh, good stories can peel back and make us vulnerable. And that can be a way into these conversations. Um, but I also think, um, you know, interacting personally. But, but, but there's other, there's, there's, so many, there's so many ways. You know, I think um, for me, so we have three children and I'm happily married. And sometimes I think it's just radical if I remind my students that it's really hard to be a parent, but it's a great blessing. And it's a really good thing that like when I'm being a parent, I have to die to myself because like I don't get to put my preferences first. Like I, I could try, but like it just doesn't work. And, and I think in a culture that, that really uh, emphasizes the importance of personal preferences and of achieving your own good life, modeling for other people a way of living for others, that can be 
upsetting in a really good way, in a really good way. So I, I think of, um, related to this, I think of the fact I've heard many people who come from broken homes um, and they're adults. And I've, I've heard many of them say something to the effect of, I, I don't want to get married because everyone I know breaks up, it ends and it's always ugly and it's painful. And when I hear that, one of the things I hear is just by being a simple father and a husband and faithful, like I'm expressing, I'm, 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 I'm living proof that, that it's possible, that the world doesn't have to revolve around yourself and you can die to yourself and that that can be a really good thing. Um, and I, 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 staying married and caring for your children and your spouse might not seem that radical, but, but uh, in a world where so many adults disappoint us and abuse people and are deceptive and I think simple faithfulness is a, is a powerful witness. Uh, I got plenty, plenty of time for questions here. So feel free to write them in the chat uh, or feel free to on mic and, uh, and speak up as well. So I, I do have a question. I was uh, appreciated so far that uh, Focus Week is, 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 is kind of dusting off the I word uh, as our second presentation in which we've heard the word idolatry. Mm. Uh, and I think it's such a, an important concept, particularly in an American context, because I think we are particularly expert at producing uh, all kinds of idols. Uh, and all kinds of uh, false religions uh, from those idols. Um, but to the to the first question uh, that the student had about how do we how do we kind of call that out in, in, in every day? Uh, how do we resist this? I wonder what you think about Christian media. Uh, and I know this kind of goes to uh, your your editorship of, of Christ and pop culture. But uh, we do have Christian radio. We do have. Christian TV, we have Christian social media, and uh, how uh, effective, in, in your opinion, have these been at helping us to uh, help, helping Christians to kind of extend this message of, look, the society we live in is idolatrous, and we need to uh, be called back to that kind of first love uh, with Jesus. That's a great, yeah. Um, you, you know, there, there are pockets of Christian media that are doing really good work. Um, but I do think that, that we have to recognize that in many ways, what, what happens, and, and it's very natural, it's very common, everybody else is doing it. What happens is that when Christians get into media, sometimes what they do very often, most often, is that they look at what's successful around them. Right. So what is the world doing? How is it working? What what does it mean to be successful in this field and television or music, whatever? And then you do that, um, which does, again, make a sort of a, a kind of sense. Um, but if you believe that our faith creates different demands on us, um, then you can't just unreflectively adopt what everybody else is doing or whatever field you're working in. Um, and so uh, lately, um, Instagram has been um, haunting me. You know, so 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 all these social media platforms or virtually all of them. What they do is they, uh, you know, they track your preferences and they want to give you more of what you look at. So I have this bad habit of being really fascinated by things that are awful. And um, so I guess at some point I must have clicked on some promoted ad for some, uh, I don't know if it was a televangelist or some pastor who decided he wanted to be super hip and cool and attractive. And he had this slick YouTube, uh, Instagram video 
and it was very vapid. It was all about, you know, being your best self this year and how God wants to bless you and help you be your best self. And really, it was just self-help language, the little sprinkled with a little baptism, you know, baptismal water, very little. <laughs> and, um, and then all of a sudden, every time I go on Instagram, like I just get a wall of these things. And what's fascinating to me is that there are uh, every day, it's I'm seeing like five new pastors who appear to be over significantly large churches who are uh, young or at, at the most middle aged who all look very good, great jaws. Notice a lot of really good jaws. They all, uh, many of them uh, in their videos as they're so here they're using this medium. So they're using Instagram as a medium, and they're using it to promote their church, but actually front and center is themselves front and center in almost all of these videos is the pastor himself so sometimes the pastor's name will have a, a branded logo right so like there's a certain font they use for the pastor's name as if to suggest like well what it's saying what it's saying is uh let me let me keep i'll say what it's saying in a minute so so they'll have you know they'll look really good they'll have great clothes um, they'll be very positive. Very often I've noticed that they'll include their wife or their children in a lot of their posts. And the children are always attractive. They're cool looking. They're smart. They're athletic. The wives are always very attractive. And the image that it gets off, this, the, 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 the implication behind this is you should want to follow this pastor because he is modeling the life that you should live, which is a life of, of wealth, because they always tend to be dressed and, and uh, I was looking at one and he kept taking photos of himself and his wife on these beaches. And there's like a yacht in the background of one of them. And I was like, wow, I cannot relate to that at all. That's that's interesting. What a life. But but what he was signaling, and it's exactly the same thing as many social media influencers will signal, is that you want to emulate this life. Like I, I've got a good life. I've, I'm making money. God is blessing me. I've got an attractive wife. I look good. I'm healthy, I'm athletic, things are great. But that's another form of idolatry. I mean, that's essentially what it's saying is the purpose of your life is to create a good identity, to create a good life for yourself. And this pastor is just using the Christian language to, to do that. Um, so, and it's effective. I mean, unfortunately it's very effective because we are attracted to people who we think have got things figured out. Um, so yes, I would say that on the whole, when Christians do that in the media, social media or otherwise, uh, what we're doing is we're actually just conceding. We're just saying what Christianity has to offer is not fundamentally different. It's a different style. It's a different tone, but the basis of it, the heart of it is live your best life now and here's how. That's the, it's, it's the same thing. Um, and, and because of that, that's, you know, those are the things that really troubled me. I think when, uh, when a non-Christian sees, let's say a promoted YouTube video or Instagram video like that, if they were to watch it and they were to watch a, a, a self-help or a life coach video, they could use the same language, just take God out. And, and I imagine that non-Christian thinking, well, why, like, why go to the church? Well, like, why, what's the point? Like what's what's the advantage? And there there really isn't one. Um, so yes, no, I think that's important to note that that unfortunately uh, we often capitulate and make our faith easily accommodatable to idol worship, idol making. Yeah. Other questions? Feel free. Yeah, you can write them out. or objections, if you think I'm wrong, that's fine. I've been wrong many times in life. I've been wrong today, I'm gonna to be wrong tomorrow. Not on Thursday, so come back Thursday, I'll be right Thursday, but tomorrow I'll probably be wrong about something. If you want me to tell stories about Dr. Belbro, if you want, I mean, you know, 
Yes, please. <laughs> No, I, I do have another question. Um, so, so you mentioned that, you know, there, there are some fields that maybe Christians just can't, uh, shouldn't be, be involved in, and, and not yeah. just the extreme ones, but, but, yeah. but ones that, ones that are, you know, uh, industries that are based upon trying to get people to lead disordered idolatrous lies and maybe you yeah. shouldn't be involved in that so i'm wondering you know how far will we take that in terms of advising advising students and maybe we aren't telling them hey you can't major in this you can't major in right. that maybe we don't want to do that mm -hmm. but uh maybe for that that senior who's faced with two job offers and and say one of it is uh you know, you're going to work 60 hours a week for this particular job, but you're going to be able to pay off those student loans in five years. And uh, you're going to be able to afford a pretty, you know, a pretty nice, you're going to get your nice introduction to the, the high consuming uh, yeah. American life. Uh, or that person has maybe a uh, 30 hour a week job in which they are going to take 20 years maybe to pay off that. Yeah. But they are going to have time for uh, they're going to have time for a, a family that they can actually spend, like spend time with. Uh, maybe they can't go on vacations, but they can, they can, they're going to have the time to spend with that family and yeah. they're going to have time to be a part of a church. Yeah. And should we be telling students, you need to choose that 30 hour job? So, you know, I, uh, w we have to be careful, I think, not to speak in, uh, absolute terms but i think we go so far to the other extreme where i think most you know christian college professors like myself would be would feel a kind of uh, anxiety about even saying to a student maybe you should think about that 30 hour a week job maybe it's better like even even saying it as a possibility i think makes makes me less uncomfortable because there's so much pressure social pressure to, to, to think in terms of a successful life in, in very strict, very, you know, prescribed American terms. Um, so I would say that we have a lot of room to lean into uh, criticizing or inviting students to think differently before we even get to the place where we're being legalistic. Like, I think we've got a lot, there's so much space where we can just say to students, hey, uh, your life is not about your career, that does not define you. So if you choose a career that takes you from your family, that takes you from your community, that takes you where you can't love your neighbor because you don't see your neighbor, um, you need to consider whether this is a, a way of honoring God or whether this is a part of a system that is deeply inhuman and anti-Christian because it treats you like a cog, which is not a Christian concept. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I would say, that, and, and I think different fields need to handle this, you know, uh, differently. So if, when I teach students who are going to go on to teach English in, in high schools, I need to be preparing my students that when they go into some public schools, they will be pressured to think of students as, you know, test scores, for example, right? And part of part of what I need to impress upon them is that when they're in that environment, they're going to need to do the hard work of loving them Christianly, thinking of them as individual humans made in the image of God. And that there might be some schools where they are no longer able to faithfully serve without treating, without dehumanizing their students. Um, and I think, you know, in, in marketing, for example, uh, I think, uh, you know, marketing professors have got to be able to say, there are ways of, ex of communicating um, the values of products without making people feel insecure and, uh, and the need for things that they don't actually need. There are honest ways of doing this. You might not sell as much. Uh, it might be just really hard to be a Christian marketer. I, I don't know. But the fact that like we should be so afraid to say that is, is, is troubling to me. Like we're not afraid to say like, well, you can't be, uh, or most people aren't afraid to say, well, you can't be Christian and um, a porn star. Like, oh, okay, well, that's easy. Yeah, sure. But can you be a Christian and spend your life persuading people that they're, they are inadequate and they'll feel alive if they buy stuff they don't need? Nobody wants to say that. Uh, so 
Um, so again, I don't want us to, 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 to slip into the absolute terms. Uh, I think we need to talk you know, person to person. However, even there, we have a lot of room where we can speak before we even get close to the realm, I think, of, 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 of legalism and telling students, well, you can't have this job. You know, I think, there's, I think we have a lot of, of, of space before we get close to that line. And just related to that, one thing that I, uh, um, I think about is um, moving away. <laughs> um, so many students, when they go to college, the conception is that they go to college and then the world is their oyster. They just move wherever they want. They have no obligation to place. I know this is something that's very important to Jeff um, and something I've learned to care about is that a place matters. And uh, so one thing I try to impress upon my students when they're coming for you know, guidance counseling or what should I do with my life is I, I encourage them to ask, what does my community need? Now, sometimes you're gonna need to move to get a job and that's okay, but let's at least add that into, to, into the, the way you're thinking about it. Because I think for many of us, we were not taught to think about that. We were taught to think you are a free entity, you are autonomous, you're floating, go wherever you want to find the fulfilling life you want without asking, where, where do, what do my people need? The people around me I've been raised with, what do they need? Um, so I think you know, that's another example of something where we can, we can still allow, you know, acknowledge that people have freedom to move from their homes, their hometown, but encourage them to think, well, what, what is this, does this, does this community need another doctor or do they need another teacher or do they need another plumber? What is it, what does it need and how can I, how could I fulfill that need? Yeah. Do you have any questions for us? Um, no, who is the first keynote? Who is the, I, I somehow missed that. Uh, Jen Pollock, Michelle. Oh, she went first, excellent, good. She's wonderful, was that good? Uh, it, was, it was a great time, yeah, we had yeah. a wonderful time, but really nice uh, connection. So I'm not sure all who's here tonight, who was here last night, but a uh, real symbiosis, honestly, be, between you both in terms of uh, having to work a lot hard at resisting the world, honestly. Good. Uh, I think that's really one that fits really well with, with the, the purposes of, of liturgy. So, um, good. I've heard from a num number of people that it's been, been a great time so far. Wonderful. Yeah, I, uh, last year before everything, the world ended. Uh, we did talk, we did correspond, Jen and I did correspond a little bit about trying to sort of be on the same page and figure out what we were going to talk about. So I'm glad that worked out really well. Good. Well, I'll be back. So. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for your time tonight. And thanks everybody for, for coming out for the, the questions and uh, you have a lot to think about. So uh, Dr. Noble will be back with us uh, Thursday afternoon. We do have more uh, we have another keynote tomorrow night with Jen Michelle, but we also have a whole slate tomorrow of uh, faculty workshops. Uh, so uh, and, and, you, know, you don't have class students, so uh, make, make sure you come out to some of those, uh, uh, those workshops and uh, one on Friday as well too. So uh, it's been a great start. Uh, thank you so much to, to Alan tonight for, for sharing with us. And uh, thanks again to Jeff Bilbro and Tom Holzinger Friesen, who've done the, you know, the, the, the hero's work of, of organizing this, uh, this year's focus week for us. So uh, thanks again, and I look forward to being with you Thursday. Thank you.